when you got your first leadership gig, loving the new role, but feeling the pressure of your new responsibilities and all that expectation to perform, well, don't worry, you're not alone. Crossing the chasm from a technical role to leadership, from doing stuff to managing and leading people is the toughest challenge any leader must make. Welcome to the Human Edge Show, the podcast dedicated to help you do just that, successfully cross the doing to leading chasm. Campbell Such here, Chief Chasm Crossing Guide. I've made all the mistakes so you don't have to. I want to help you learn those lessons much more easily by sharing my experiences and talking with brilliant people who have already figured it out. You'll get great actionable tips, strategies and techniques to make the transition so much easier and faster for you. Now let's get to it. Well, welcome to this episode of the Human Head Show. Today, I'm privileged to have Daya Sivakumar with me. Daya is the Chief Operating Officer at AMP Wealth New Zealand. Uh, welcome, Daya. Thanks very much for, uh, for joining us. Campbell, um, you've uh, threatened to have me on a podcast at some point, so here we are. Glad <laughs> I could help. Fantastic. Uh, I'll just um, I'll just cover off Dyer's bio, which um, I'm going to read to make sure that I get it right. So Dyer is currently Chief Operating Officer at AMP Wealth Management New Zealand, where he oversees client services, technology, and commercial services. Dyer is an experienced technology leader who has worked across a number of industries, including travel, telco, payments, healthcare, and financial services. While working with some well-known household brands, Dyer has driven aggressive business transformation programs, combining customer experience, technology, and operating model changes. It's an impressive bio, Dyer. I hate bios. Bios, bios sound, <laughs> they sound so impersonal, right? I mean, it's, you can read a bio and say, oh, yeah, that stuff makes sense, but it's just kind of not me because um, I like to think I'm a bit different. It's, fu it's, funny when you, it's funny when you hear your own bio, isn't it? Is that me? Uh, look, <laughs> yeah. to, to kick off, what I'd, uh, what I'd like to ask you is, what's something about you that not many people would know? There's uh, probably lots about me that people don't know, but uh, what can I share is probably the question. Um, they're probably the obvious thing. People look at me and say, um, obviously, of Asian origin, so I'm Sri Lankan by birth, but um, it really surprises people when I say that I was actually born in Gisborne and I grew up um, in Southland, a little country town in Southland. And uh, certainly most people fall off their chair when they hear that. So that's, but spread the word. I'm comfortable if that goes out. Yep. Well, you uh, you certainly have a, um, a fairly uh, convincing Kiwi accent. So um, <laughs> I, I almost believe you. Well, well rehearsed, yeah. <laughs> yeah well rehearsed, that's right. <laughs> So just um, thinking back on your career, Dyer, and some conversations that we've had in the past, um, there's been some, some, some real epiphanies that you've had over the, over the years and some, some amazing mentors and, and, uh, and people that have helped you um, take the opportunities as they've, they've shown up in your career. In your, in your journey from where you started, what, was the, what were the first steps that you took into leadership and, and how did they come about? Um, I, I mean, I, I did have a, um, you know, a technical background and I'm, I always consider myself an engineer at heart, right? So that's probably who I am. And I actually think I, I like a lot of people, I stumbled into a leadership role because I was good at what I did, or I, you know, became good at what I did. And, um, and as people recognize that you just got more things thrown at you, you got more opportunities and you developed and suddenly you're a, a team leader or a manager or a supervisor. So my path went from more or less systems administrator to kind of uh, IT manager to kind of CIO and that you know I'm paraphrasing a little bit there's some gaps in there but and so I was a technical guy I was a technical leader and I you know was a subject matter expert and suddenly today you are run this thing um, so and, and and you know as you and I have talked about Campbell um, the piece about leadership I knew there was so small um, I was just kind of thrown into the hot seat so here you go you've got this you've got a few people reporting to you make it work Right. Yeah, a lot of a lot of new leaders do end up in those roles, uh, often in a sink or swim. They, they were the best, the best, best person in the team, or someone saw some um, something in them that made them think that they could succeed as a leader. But often there's no lead into it, no lead into it, no exposure to it. So when you found yourself in those in those first leadership roles, what were the biggest challenges that you that you found 
in making that step across from doing stuff, that technical role into leading and managing people, which was a whole, you know, it's a whole, there a whole different set of skills. But looking back on it now, I'm just going back 20 years, so show my age, but I, I think the biggest issues are when I was in those first, actually my first CIO role, um, I still very much had that technical bent. So I kind of had a technical view of the world. Um, I knew kind of the tasks that had to be done. Um, you know, like a lot of people, I probably had a perfectionist bent in me, so it had to be done a certain way. So I'd end up doing it myself. Uh, and and I, you know, I'm, you know, you always look and cringe back in hindsight, but I think the my lack of ability to better message what I was trying to do and put it on paper and grow people was clearly looking back glaring, right? Um, I just got stuff done because it had to be done, and I was also very tactical. Like this had to be done for the next project, next month, next quarter. Um, so I think I'd, if you combine them, still love to play with stuff and do stuff personally. Didn't really give a lot of thought to the team people. They were buddies or friends, which is cool, but didn't really think about developing them. Um, and was very short-term thinking. Um, right. They're probably three broad things in reflection. Yeah. And, and what was it that helped you turn that turn that, that mindset, that view, that way you operated around? What, what, what helped you make the, the steps into, the, in, into being a, you know, a great leader and, and really helping to develop your team and to, and to grow others in their roles? Um, I hate to think of myself as a great leader. It sounds too <laughs> grandiose. But I think, look, I, I did have a, a moment, um, which you and I have talked about in the past, with one of my jobs where my CEO uh, at the time basically told me to get the screwdriver out of my hand and actually help to run the business with him. He actually, literally his words were, you're too valuable to me to be sitting there mucking around with the technology, come sit next to me and work on the business with me. I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, and, you know, for me at that time, I valued myself and my contribution based on what I could do. You know, my admin access, my root access, I could, someone rang up with a problem, whatever it was, or needed a project done, I'd do it. Um, that was me. That was why I thought I was actually good and valued. Um, had no idea what he was talking about. So he actually made um, some of the other IT guys take away my admin rights and my root access. Um, <laughs> so I couldn't touch and I couldn't play. And that was, I hated it. I, I you know, I thought, you know, I'm being punished. Um, but, you know, in hindsight, best thing anyone could have ever done for me. So that was a, a big turning point. Yeah, that, that's, um, I, I love that. I love that term. I kind of think it is, think of it as a, uh, you know, being the screwdriver manager, which is <laughs> yeah. you're kind of, you're stuck halfway in between, you know, you're not, yeah, you're not, a, you're not a manager or a leader and you're, you're not the technical guy anymore. Um, where are you and where do you sit? And uh, sounds to me like you got incredibly lucky uh, in some ways with that, with that, with that leader. And I, I think a lot of us in our roles and our transitions into those, we don't necessarily have that, that wise leader, that that powerful mentor that that um, that guides us and, and allows us to do that. I think it's great that no, you I, can take away your technic, you know, your your ability to actually your admin privileges on the system. Um, well, you imagine that, right? You just you, you're used to, you know, if someone wants to do something, you just log in, get it done, sorted, and you're the hero as well as being the guy who knows it all. But suddenly you can't do that. Someone calls you and you have to say, well, actually, I need to push you on to so-and-so to do it and you've got to explain to someone else why this has to be done and how it should be done and and suddenly it's not that simple anymore um, so based on based on your experience of making that transition and having someone grab effectively grab you by the scruff of the neck and say you're not doing that you need to move into this role what advice would you give to a, a new technical leader the new person who's come from a technical role into a leadership role and perhaps doesn't have a mentor or a coach or a boss or someone that's doing that for them uh, what, what's, what, what advice would you give them? I mean, first things first. I mean, you're probably in that role because you're highly valued and all your, you, you know your stuff, so that's awesome. But I think the things that made you great at your previous role aren't necessarily going to make you step up and do a fantastic job with your new one. And I think just recognising that for a start is probably the, the key. Um, I don't think you need to solve that problem straight away. Um, I always think it's good to have senior people or mentors to talk to, as you said, um, Campbell. Um, otherwise, there's a lot of there's a lot of material on the, on the interweb that you can actually look at as well that, that can help. Um, the, I think the biggest thing that I you know the epiphany I had, if you like, when I had the screwdriver taken out of my hand, was that um, I can make a difference in two three years time by some of the actions and some of the planning that I'm doing now, um, as opposed to fixing something on the spot. And when you start thinking about it that way, um, you start imagining work as being quite different. So your role becomes more, and depending on how senior you are, of course, 
your role becomes more about managing change or delivering something or providing a vision for a future state, um, which is quite different from fixing something. So it is quite, I mean, there's some books that are really valuable as well. I mean, um, one of these, and you're, you're right to say that I had a, you know, I got a lucky break with one of my CEOs. I have to say, I've probably had four or five lucky breaks in my career with really good leaders who have helped me. Um, and a couple of them shoved books down my way. I mean, you know, not, not unknown books, but Good to Great was a big one, which was to me, Never, never even occurred to me uh, about uh, you know the, the concepts that were in that book and, and why, but leading as a relatively new leader, it's like, oh, okay, never really thought about that stuff. So I think there's some good leadership material you can read on. And look, the other thing I'd say is I, I think we all have a perception of leadership about being, you know, you know, maybe a, um, I was trying to think of an example, but being this massive orator who can stand on a stage and wow audiences, I don't think that's the case at all. I think you can actually be an introvert and a quiet person and be a really good leader. Um, you just need to have some confidence and, and you know, be yourself as well. And, and a lot of people try and be someone else, which I think is, is, is wrong and it yeah. won't work long term. Yeah, find, finding you and your style and having the confidence to, to lead and manage in, in that way and recognizing that you don't have to have all the have to have all the answers, but perhaps you should have a whole bunch of questions um, and learning how to ask good questions and develop people. And I really like your your epiphany, which was the seeing out two or three years. And I guess that also allowed you to not only build strategy for that, but also invest in people or or see the value of investing in people to to grow them over a long or help them themselves right over a, over a longer period of time correct well a couple of things you start to think a lot bigger because you're not dealing with a you know, small problem and when you th start to think a bit bigger um you can't do it on your own you realize that and whether that's you know other partners or, as in other companies or, or your people that you need to invest in and grow in um, they suddenly become far more important to you and then you also realize that you can't get to this thing you're imagining in two or three years time without the right people and the right partners and without selling a dream or a vision so um, and I think they're kind of kind of key ingredients, right? You've, you're, you're very much moving away from doing tasks really well to being able to plan and set a vision and take people along with you. And that, to me, is quite a fundamental shift. Yeah. Vision vision's one of the key pieces of, of leadership as opposed to management, right? And, um, and it sounds like you fairly early on in your career worked out that, you know, a longer term vision was a bigger picture thinking and, and looking out into the future. So how do you go about selling that how did you learn to sell a vision because it's not something that necessarily comes easily to people the whole idea of taking people on a journey it sounds like a great idea but what are the what are some practical tips for helping someone a create the vision and but perhaps most importantly once they've got it then sell the idea in the best possible way of, of selling it um, to the team and to the business i mean i, I mean i'd probably start by saying Whatever you do, be authentic, right? Like I think if you're trying to, if, and look, I've, I've moved around a few companies, as you know, because it's been a conscious decision by me just to expose myself to different industries and different types of environments. One thing I'm conscious of not doing is going into any new environment or new company or new team and saying, hey, I know how to solve all your problems. I'm the expert. That's completely wrong. I think to build a credible vision, you have to understand the business and the people, right? So wherever you are, and so talk to people. Um, I don't think anyone sitting in a corner office, um, you know, with screeds of paper or a laptop is going to come up with a vision that's going to work or be compelling. Um, so any new role I go into, I make sure I spend a lot of time talking to people and understanding where they are, because the chances are they've already got the vision. In fact, I find that more often than not, the thing that you need to find, the vision or the future state, it's there. People know it. They just haven't articulated it. So... I think if you spend your time as a new leader talking to everybody and forming a view, getting some themes, um, that's probably your vision. You'll probably find it in there. And but then the trick comes to how do you actually paint it, paint that picture, get the buy and sell it. Um, and that's probably two or three technique, techniques. I think one is you definitely need to be able to socialise and talk to people and be trusted. Um, and again, you don't, you're not trusted by being, you know, this business type that goes and has formal meetings. I think you actually have to be yourself. And say, hey, I talked to all these people when I came to this place and I got the idea that this was a problem and that this is what we should do. What do you think? And you get more opinions and then play all the stuff back to them. So, you know, say you go into a place and you've done a whole lot of conversations, you've found out a whole lot of things, play it back to people. Hey, here's what I found. What do you think? And then you get their automatic buy in into what you're thinking because they're part of the conversation. And then once you honed it, whether that's, you know, whether it's a PowerPoint or, or a, you know, a, a conversation you're going to have, play it all back to them in a more of a, a structured manner. 
Um, and I think you, you tend to get support that way, but you have to be yourself in doing that. I, I do have a, um, and no offense to anyone listening to this, but I do have a little bit of a dislike to some of the consulting firms who do this because they tend to come in and apply what they know to your business or your context versus actually listening more. And, and I think being an internal person in a company doing this, you've got far more chance of getting by because it's your company, right? So. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, Campbell. But <laughs> okay. no, 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 you absolutely did. Um, the idea of um, talking to people, to, to <laughs> of finding the vision that's already there, that's really powerful, yeah. playing it back. And then, and then that really helped and, and, and getting more feedback really helps to take people along, along on that journey. That's, um, that's great yeah. advice. That's and, and look, you can, you can uh, look, and I, and I can talk about my current role. When I started there, I obviously did a similar thing and, and it was very informal. I mean, I just talked to everybody. I mean, I made a point of talking to everybody in the IT team just to see where they were and what they thought. And I put it all together and I played it back to the IT team saying, hey, here's what you told me. And, um, and you know, of course, it was what they told me because it was, generally was, right? They said, here's what I think we need to do based on what you told me. And I pulled out, you know, whatever it was, five or six strategies. I said, yeah, that kind of makes sense. So it was, I was just playing back what they already were thinking, right? It wasn't, I wasn't a genius. Um, and uh, certainly automatically, I think most people would have bought into that. I mean, there's always some people who will be negative. That's just life. But if you believe in it and you think it's the right way, then back yourself. Yeah. Now, now look, that's, that's fantastic. And then I guess you can then bring your outside looking in insight into into that to add whatever might be um, missing that you can see and also to bring multiple sub strategies together into one big overarching one and right, then yeah. obviously then you have to make sure the team's bought into it but then sell it up into the into your boss and to you yep. know the, the other parts of the business um yeah. that, that need to yeah. buy and, and, and actually and go with it one, one of the one of the ceos i had um i can't remember which one it was said that people you know people want to be led they want it well, they want to see a, a vision and a strategy and they want to know what to do um, but um, often people dance around it too much. But yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's in some ways it's not as hard as it seems. We just make it harder than it should be. Yeah, it's, it sounds like grandiose, doesn't it, when you think of strategy? But it does. Um, it does, you know, yeah. the way you've explained it, it's probably one of the best ways I've heard it explained, and and, uh, and the way of distilling it too. I, I have to say, it's one one of the questions you asked me earlier. Um, one of those things when I when I thought I became a much better employee is when I became I was just me. When I was trying to imitate somebody else, as this is what was expected, I was I don't think I was any good. Um, and I just don't care anymore, right? I, I am who I am. Um, I have my style and I, and I do things my way and um, you know, I get a result. I'm not trying to pretend I'm some flash Harry or some consultant or anything else. I do things my own way. And I think everybody should do the same. They should never feel that they need to you know, be someone else. Understand what you need to do and you know, get some good techniques and some learnings, but be yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's powerful. And and when I hear you say I don't care anymore, that's not my. I, I wouldn't be taking that. I, I don't take that at face value. You're you you do d- care deeply for the, for what you do and for the projects that you're involved in for the organisation. In my experience and and for, from what I've known of you. So, but I think, but what I'm hearing is, or what I believe you mean is that you don't you don't you you're not taking that into account. You're being you're being you and focusing on being an authentic. Yeah, person. I mean, I play one. But I mean, I, as, there was a time and place where I would not have gone to work without wearing a suit, right? And and I, I, why did I wear a suit? I just hated suits, but I wore suits because my boss wore a suit and everyone wore a suit. Yeah. And today I said, you know what? I'm not a suit guy. I'm a t-shirt guy. I'm just going to wear a t-shirt from now on, or a, or a, whatever jeans or whatever the hell it is. And um, um. And it was me. I mean, I, and it was. I didn't need to try and conform and be somebody else. Right? I mean, I did. Yeah, you know, obviously, I cared about the company and what I was trying to do, but I didn't really care what people thought of me because I wasn't wearing a suit. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have to say, I'm pretty disappointed that you're not in a suit today. No, <laughs> you're only in a white hole t-shirt. Yeah, correct. <laughs> I have changed it up. I was wearing a black t-shirt normally, as you probably know, but white today. So. Well, yeah, it just stands out a little bit against the chair in the background, right? <laughs> yeah, true, true. The, yeah. the rugby league jerseys, uh, rugby league jerseys in the back, Correct. in the background Correct. there. Yeah. Um, just before I go on to the next thing, which is which I'd like to ask you around um, around uh, being a leader of leaders and some of the things around that that might be really valuable to know. What's your connection with rugby league? Um, well, it, it's uh, actually funnily enough, it's probably since school. Um, I've always. Uh, well, if I'm really honest, uh, high school, you know, rugby league was a dirty sport, right? Principals and typical high schools hate league. It's a dirty sport. You know, really, they don't say it, but what they mean is it's a poor sport that we don't want to be part of, right? That's really what they're thinking. And I hated that. I just hated the fact that, that uh, you know, sitting in my high school, the first 15 was everything. And anyone who played league for a club in a weekend was banned or not allowed to play first 15. And I just said, oh, really? Yeah, yeah I was, um, you know, 
won't name schools and all that stuff, but you know, it was back back in the eighties, obviously. Um, so I actually just I actually start to um, I mean, a lot of my friends played league, and I actually you know, liked who they were, and I just didn't like the way they'd been treated, so I kind of got behind it that way. And of course, I watched the Winfield Cup back in the in the nineties, the and um, when we were going to have our own team in the uh, contest, I got all behind what was going to be an Auckland-based side, so and I've just been with it ever since. But it's probably the battler. It's the underdog. Um, people don't like it. Um, and, um, you know, that got me into it. But I actually find that the rugby league community in New Zealand is, is just awesome. You know, they're really good people, down-to-earth people. Not what you always expect. I think people think rugby league, you think, you know, you know rough gang types that are, live in South Auckland. That's not true at all. I mean, yeah, of course there are. And they're good people, some of them, and they're not, not all bad. But... It's just every day. You go to Eden Park, you'll find a whole lot of, you know, no, no offence, but middle-aged white people sitting there drinking lattes. You go to Mount Smart, you'll find all sorts, everyone. You'll still find middle-aged people drinking lattes, but you'll have a whole lot of people drinking lime as well, right? So it's, um, so I, I kind of like the, the variety of the people who support rugby league, and I, and I love the game. It's a good game. And um, since pre, you know, I was out on the street signing, um, uh, what do you call it? Was that like a wasn't a petition, but it was trying to get signatures to get our club into the Winfield Cup back in the early 90s as well. So I've always been behind the Warriors. So it's, um, yeah, been with me, been with me for a long time. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, I, and I guess following league and in particular the Warriors, uh, you know, it must have built some massive resilience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get harassed about it all the time. But actually it's become me, right? I mean, everyone knows me and I'm a Warriors fan and, and you know, that is self stuff. It's, uh, you know, why are you a Warriors fan, you know? But um, but it's actually it's about the it's about the enjoyment. It's not it's not clearly you'd like them to win and do better, but it's actually just a good community. I mean, anyone who's ever spent time with Warriors fans or you know season member or whatever, you, you know what it's like. So yeah, and I get a hard time. <laughs> definitely, definitely get a hard time. <laughs> well, thanks for that that insight, Dyer. That's uh, that's great. Um, so just to um, to come back to the question I, I wanted to ask you earlier, uh, in terms of, so. Making that transition from a technical role into a leadership into a leadership role is one of the biggest changes and biggest transitions you'll ever make in your life. It's kind of like there's a big chasm of going from being a technical expert and knowing your stuff and feeling confident to being this brand new newbie who kind of doesn't know anything about all the stuff that they knew before that got them where they are isn't the stuff that's going to get them up that next hill. What can what can a um, so, so people that select new leaders into those roles are leaders themselves. What can they do to support that? To, to support those new leaders in those roles to make it as um, as likely as possible that they're going to succeed and that they're right across that that big that big dip from being a real expert into into being a newbie and having to learn a whole lot and and go through the sorts of things that you went through is as easy as possible. So what can what can those leaders of leaders do to 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 make sure they recognise the challenges? Remember the challenges, perhaps that they had when they did it, and uh, and then support their their new leaders into the into success that they that they obviously believe that they can that they can make. Where a lot of what happens is people get thrown on the deep end and it's sink or swim. Yeah. I actually think just take time out and tell the stories, right? Like I mean, you know, I'm, I've been talking about you know my journey and what I used to be and used to think. Um, I actually think sharing that with your teams, if, if that's you, um, will go a long way. Because I mean, I mean, the biggest problem I had when I was just moved into that role is I, I didn't know, right? Um, if someone had sat down with me, which is what that boss who said take the screwdriver out of your hand was trying to say, was don't be the technical guy, lead. Lead means all this other stuff which you don't know yet. So I actually think just tell the time, take the time to tell them that. Um, and and look, I have to say, I'll put my hand up and say, day in day out, I'm I'm so busy focusing on the next thing to do that I often don't spend enough time doing that with my teams. But um, I did start a, a leadership forum with um, some of my team where I'm trying to expose them to other people's thinking. So um, get some external speakers to come in and talk about leadership and what it means to them and how it impacted on them and, and tell some stories. And I think the more people and the more stories they have and some of the stuff you're doing here, Campbell, is great insight into that. Um, the more people will say, oh, okay, I get that, I get that. And here are a variety of different people as well. It doesn't have to be the same same person. Yeah. So, and look, to be honest, there's probably a lot of leaders in, who haven't had a huge amount, because New Zealand's a funny place, right? We've got leaders in fairly senior roles who don't always have years and years of experience. I think even if you don't have the experience yourself, bring in people who do uh, and let them talk. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, it shows you a bloody good leader if you're willing to say, I don't know everything, but I'll get some other people to help me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of, a lot of people that end up in leadership roles don't necessarily end up there through any kind of path or progress they just get plucked out as being probably the best technical expert and put into you know into running the team um, you know kind of like putting the halfback from um 
from the Warriors into coaching the team, right? Or, or maybe yeah, captaining yeah. the team, whichever way you've got that analogy you want to look. Yeah. And that's a real challenge, right? If you've never learned to manage people, manage strategy, work out how to coach a team, all that kind of stuff, it's it's a real, uh, it can be a real challenge. And so they end up in those roles, have to work it all out for themselves. And then as they get promoted up, up through the ranks, if they haven't been through any kind of formal leadership training or had a really good mentor or mentors like you have, they may well end up in a senior role without that understanding of um, what a, I guess, a, you know, what good leadership is about other than what they've worked out for themselves. So often the people that report to them may well end up <laughs> not being able to learn as much from them because they haven't got so much to teach. And so it's, yeah. a, it's kind of one of those those vicious circles. But I, um, I, do, I, I do remember, uh, you know, one of my CEOs, um, you know, he's part of this really large global company. Um, I remember him being at one stage saying to the entire company, I've never run a, a company this size, um, you know, and I need your help. And I, you know, because I'm not going to get this done on my own. And, and, and he goes, you know, I know my stuff, but I, I have never run a company this size. And, 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 I, and I, you know, you, you think then you go, oh, that's a stupid thing to say. You want to say, I'm in charge. I know exactly what I'm doing and where I'm going. But he didn't. And he was very genuine and authentic about his, his, um, his limitations. And even though I didn't necessarily learn, you know, how to run a company that size from him, everyone wanted to work for him. Everyone wanted to make him succeed, right? So by the mere fact, by being vulnerable and, and being authentic about that, everyone said, okay, we want to help this guy. We want to make it work, right? So, and I, and I think there's, again, there's nothing wrong with that. I have no problem with that, a leader coming to me, even if it was my CEO or someone saying, you know what, I have no idea how to do this. I've never done it before. I need your help. Can you help me? That's great though, right? I mean, that's part of, part of what you want a leader to do understand what they, where they need help and how you can work on it together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that one of the big challenges that a lot of us have as leaders is we feel we have to have all the answers and that's counterproductive because you can't have all the answers. Everyone has to come to you to get the answer instead of working it out for themselves and ultimately it leads to you as being a massive bottleneck and I've seen that in, in a number of organisations where at the senior level in the organisation, the CEO level, everything had to go through through them. <laughs> I, uh, I call it a mouse pad manager. This particular one was that this person, the CEO, had to make purchasing decisions for people to buy mouse pads. It was just, you know, and it wasn't a small company either. It was just, and you look at that and you go, that's crazy, but that's where we end up sometimes, right? And it really stifled the ability for that company to grow. And uh, so- And, and you, you end up having that CEO, I don't know who the person is obviously, but they're spending all their time improving purchases for my, my spads. Uh, not that you need them anymore, but I'm sure it was a while ago. Yeah. Um, surely their time and their energy should be focused more on where the hell the company should be going and you know, what the customer's experience should look like and you know, not not freaking signing off a mouse pads, right? So, <laughs> That's so, right. So he, yeah. needs to, he actually needs to trust his people to get that stuff done, or he or she, I should say. Yeah, and, and interestingly, when uh, when that person moved on, from by their own choice, um, the person that took over had a completely different view, and it's um, it's uh, it was transformational in the company in terms of the culture and the way the business developed and grew. So um, yeah. powerful thing. Um, Dyer, just before just before we wrap up, um, is there anything that uh, that I haven't asked you that I should have, or any other sort of final comments that you'd like to make um, um, that, that could help new leaders or the, or their bosses? Well, first things first. I mean, and you know, like a, similar to the thing we were talking about, I'm. I don't consider myself an expert in leadership. I think anyone who says an expert is probably not. Um, it, it is, I, I genuinely, without being cheesy, it is a journey and I'm still learning. There's a lot of new stuff I'm picking up, especially now, right? A post-pandemic leadership model looks different. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I would honestly say that myself and, and I know my colleagues, um, you know, I think while we've been on the bleeding edge of, you know, some of the fixie work um, items and ideas, there's still a lot to learn and, and what the, the future workplace looks like, not, not six months time or three months time, but in say two, three years time, what does workplace look like and how do you interact with teams working all over the world and remotely? How do you collaborate? How do you create a sense of culture? That's stuff I don't know the answers to. And that's going to be, I think, a real challenge for everybody. And I don't think anyone, I've been trying to read up and see what good things are happening, lots of good things happening, but I don't think anyone's really solved that problem. So I think it's going to definitely be our next big topic in leadership. Because all the stuff that we've learned and all the stuff that we've done in the last kind of 20 years, certainly in my career, that's cool, but now it's all changed. So so that'll be interesting. So to have those little hallway conversations, trying to form a view and get a vision, how you do that when you're not in the office um, or if you've got people spread across the country. Um, so, yeah, so look, I think it's um, interesting. It's always changing. It's never, if 
you know, buying a book and saying you've read it now, you know, everything is not going to work, right? So, yeah. The best thing you can do is keep talking, keep listening, and keep reading. Yep. Fantastic. You, you, you never learn to ride a bike by reading a book or watching a YouTube video, <laughs> do you? That's <You> <laughs> no, true. Yeah, correct. <laughs> you got to get out and, and uh, get those training wheels off and fall over and graze your knees and learn some stuff as you go. So I think it's pretty exciting, though. I'm really looking forward to figuring out how we actually run these teams remotely and how do you keep everyone synced up and keep engagement high. And 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 obviously, you're going to have the same as you had before, you know, your, your CEO who clicked on mouse pad, you know, wanted to sign off purchase orders for mouse pads. I'm sure you're going to have CEOs who want to you know, watch everyone, make sure they're working eight hours a day or whatever else, and that's not going to work in this environment either. So we'll see what emerges as a good model. Yeah, well, I'll uh, I'll be really interested to um, to to come back and maybe have this conversation in two to three years' time and see uh, yeah. see what we've discovered and what we've learned and what you've discovered and learned over that yep. time. Yeah. Look forward to it. Um, Dyer, that's been absolutely outstanding. Thank you very much. It's been great having your insight and thoughts and and ideas and uh, and some stuff that we can take away and, and apply. So thank you very much. It's uh, been fabulous having you on the, the Human Ed Show. All right. Thanks, Campbell. And thanks all. all right. Okay. Thanks. See you later. See ya. Thanks for listening. If you have a friend or a colleague who would benefit from this episode, please pass the word along. If you have a friend or a colleague who would not benefit, but you haven't been in touch with them for a while, give them a call iTunes reviews are great to get the word out and to help me create the show that's most useful for you. And if you're frustrated or having challenges or would like some help, guidance, assistance with your first leadership role, then check out integrationcatalyst.com in the link in the podcast notes below. Or pass this on to your boss to nudge them to get you the help you really need to cross the doing to managing chasm and get you powered up on your leadership and management journey. Oh, and if you want to make sure you don't miss an episode, hit subscribe. Until next time.